everyone. I'm here with Joe Cunningham, quilter extraordinaire. <laughs> and I have to say that um, a couple of years ago, you were the speaker in the evening, right? Yeah, last year. Last It was last year. Because I did um, a segment on Facebook, a mm. part of your talk, because I could not stop laughing. <laughs> I couldn't stop <laughs> laughing. It was just this great combination of quilts and you know what it reminded me of? In fact, I told um, G this morning, he reminds me of uh, Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> uh, uh, comedians in cars getting coffee. Oh. That kind of humor, you know, that just kind of catches you off guard. If you're not really listening, mm -hmm. you might not get the line. Uh -huh. But if you pay attention, you're going to have a belly laugh. Oh, well, good. And the whole room was busting up. It was that. a lot of fun. That night oh. was a special night. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So that's a, a little segment of that's out on Facebook. So. Oh, good. Yeah. So tell us about your quilting life. When did it start? How did it start? Uh, it started in 1979. I was uh, uh, a guitar player for hire, and um, I just finished my one year of college studying English. I wanted to be a writer, and uh, I was back in my hometown, Flint, Michigan. And a woman came into the bar one night where I was playing and introduced herself and said that she needed a, uh, a guitar player on some folk music gigs. And I said, great. And um, uh, over at her house for rehearsals, uh, her name was Gwen Marston, and over at her house for rehearsals I saw these boxes full of quilts. And I asked her what that was all about and she said that she had gotten a grant to document another woman's collection, Mary Schaefer. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, wow. uh, to document, and because nobody knew who Mary was, and Gwen thought she was one of the best quilters that had ever lived, uh -huh. and she wanted to first document this 300 quilt collection and this archive that was part of it. Of, so uh, she had all 300 quilts? She had about 100 at that time, uh -huh. uh, ready to hand off to the photographer. Wow, and that she was, was a project. A big project. She was documenting all the quilts, loving the whole project, uh, measuring and figuring out how old they were and everything, and dreading writing the catalog. And I had had a year of college studying English mm -hmm. and knew basically everything there was to know about writing, mm -hmm. as you can imagine. Yeah. At that point, you know, and having studied it for a year. Yeah, and what an opportunity. Right. And so I offered to write the catalog. I said, I could write that catalog for you. And she said, well, you'd have to know something about quilts. And uh -huh. my one year in college, I had heard a, uh, a graduate student saying, that uh, when you're in graduate school, what you have to do is to read all the available literature, which to me, being a bookworm, was the, like, are you kidding? You get to read all the available literature on whatever? The... Whatever subject. So that's what I said. She said, you'd have to know something about quilts. I said, how about if I read all the available literature? And um, so she uh, got me copies of the five or six books that there were at that time uh, with any scholarly in, right, uh, uh, right. content. And I Because the world hadn't exploded. The quilt 1979, world had, yeah, uh -huh. had not exploded yet. Very, very few books. I mean, I could name them. There was uh -huh. the Marie Webster book from uh, 1912. Uh, there was the Dr. <laughs> Dutton book from 1923. There was the Ruth Finley, two Ruth Finley books. And uh, It's kind of like there was only that one book on how to raise your children at one It's point. like that. Uh, the Robert Bishop and uh, Carrie Safanda. So, um, uh, so I read all the books, looked at the quilts, and started to fall in love with the whole idea of quilts, and started, uh, and then went over to interview Mary. And I mm -hmm. kind of have a thing about old ladies. I love old ladies. So I met Mary, who was then, uh, this was 1979. You're so in she the was, right business. Yeah, yeah, 69 <laughs> years old. And um, and you were how old? I was a 27-year-old guitar player. Wow. Uh, I didn't really see this coming. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, I totally dug Mary, interviewing her, finding out about her fascinating life. She'd started making quilts in uh, 1940. She was born in Hungary and came over in 1915, right before a bunch of her family members died in the influenza epidemic or uh, pandemic in 1918. Uh, I mean, a fascinating life. And because um, I had not only to write the catalog, but also to write a biography of Mary, uh, a short biography to, to go into the catalog. So. I was getting into it more and more, and uh, one night Gwen came over to my apartment with a little quilt in a hoop, uh, a little quilt sandwich, you mm -hmm, would say, mm -hmm. in a hoop, and a big thimble and a needle and thread, and said, if you're going to write about quilts, you should know how to quilt. 
<clears throat> I'm sick of reading these books and articles by people that never made a quilt. They don't know uh -huh. what, what it's all about. So she taught me the rocking stitch on this little quilt top, which I realized later actually had sort of metaphorical content. It's a crib quilt in the pattern known as Drunkard's Path. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, oh. <laughs> so that's I learned to quill on a drunkard's path, and um, uh, so tell me it was pink or blue. <laughs> it was uh, white muslin and natural muslin. It was you could barely what? even see the so pattern. It was white and off white. Oh, that that would be that would be very contemporary now. Yeah, this is nineteen seventy nine. Right, I know. I know that was cutting edge. Tone right? on tone. Yeah. So I learned how to quilt there, and then in about a week, my stitches were good enough. I could quilt with her at the frame, and then in about two weeks, I wanted to make my own uh, uh, quilt, and she said she would help me, and so we started making quilts together, mm -hmm. and um, then I realized that once we got the project done with Mary, that if, uh, with Mary's collection, that if we were going to, the, uh, the whole idea was to get something done with this collection, to get it housed in some institution, mm -hmm. and... Um, if we were going to make that happen, something would have to be different because nobody's going to listen to these this guitar player and, and folk singer uh, that like to make quilts on the side. I don't know. It's kind side. of like a really interesting movie. Yeah. Don't you think? So, uh, um, like Thelma I, and Louise, but the guitar player, and the quilter. So I, I told her, uh, "Here's what we should do. One day, we should become professional quilters." Because that way, we could use Mary's quilts as examples in lectures and magazine articles. I'd already been hired to write a magazine article about Mary. And um, uh, maybe books. Maybe we'd get a book contract sometime. And we could use Mary's quilts in it. And get the, and, and that through the back door, get her quilts famous. We could uh, get some credibility in the quilt world if mm -hmm. we were professionals. And then we could finally get some leverage and get this thing housed somewhere. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which took a long time. Uh, 10 or 11 years, but what finally happened was uh, Mary's collection was acquired by Michigan State University Museum, mm -hmm. and her archive was acquired at the same time and uh, formed the nucleus of the Great Lakes Quilt Study Center at Michigan State University mm -hmm. Museum. So uh, we got mission accomplished. Mary ended up in the Quilters Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. which is really, really And great. you would be the resident expert by then. By then. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that's right. Except uh, Gwen and I stopped working together. We worked together all through the 80s. Mm -hmm. We wrote a bunch of books and videos and stuff together. And then we uh, went different ways starting in 1992. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I moved to New York City. And then I moved to Vermont I, 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 to be a music director of a theater company. Oh. And then I moved to Vermont to have my own radio show. Oh, you're using the same side of the brain now. Yeah, the whole that's time. right. Wow. And I was living in Vermont when my friend Julie Silber called me up, and uh, she was in San Francisco, and had a. Uh, her, she was the curator of the Esprit Clothing Company quilt collection. Oh. And the owners had uh, split up, were getting divorced, and. She could see the writing on the wall. This is going to be the end of the company. Mm -hmm. And so she was going to have to find a new job, and she had to start her own quilting company. And Julie is a brilliant scholar and historian of quilts and dealer, but she is a terrible writer. <laughs> uh, awful. And um, Everybody has their thing. That's right. <laughs> that and so Julie needed a writer a quilt writer, and in, to, for some shows that she was doing, an Amish quilt writer. And, and I'm not Amish, but I had written books about Amish quilting, and, uh, uh -huh. uh, uh, I, and I studied the Amish and quilted with the Amish and so on. So uh, she offered to hire me to come to San Francisco mm -hmm. for five months. And I said I would do that. Uh, she, she and what year was that? 1993. Oh, at the 93? end of 93. Okay. And so I called my friend that I had a little theater company with in uh, New York City, Josh, and uh, said, guess what I'm doing? Uh, start leaving December 1st, I'm going to uh, San Francisco. Get out of the winter, I'll be there for five months. Uh -huh. uh, he said, who do you know in San Francisco? I said, I know three lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> and neener, he, neener. Yeah, neener, neener. He said, uh, you got to call my cousin. Uh, uh, you, she's, uh, she's danced all over the world. Uh, she was a director at the uh, rock and roll music school there, and she'll introduce you to musicians, and she'll show you around. And I'm great. So I met his cousin, and we started talking about getting married and having kids, and we got married and had kids. And I'm there ever since. Wow. So 25 wow. years 
Yeah. Back when years. San Francisco was a little bit more affordable to to make a home base. When I met Carol, she had a uh, four thousand square foot loft in the <gasps> warehouse district. Oh my gosh! A huge, beautiful loft. Uh, we would have big band rehearsals, dance company rehearsals, and everything there. That she paid fifteen hundred dollars a month for. I oh mean, my. it was just uh, absurd. And so, yeah, it was pretty great. It was like everything I ever dreamed uh, that. Uh, of a way to live was uh, to live in a big city in a loft full of artists. You know? Right, and and using all the different arts you love yes. in one spot. That's, That's right. That's got to be awesome. So, so are you still there in no, the loft? Uh, no, she was running that, and she had just bought a house right after the earthquake. Uh, Carol yeah. uh, uh, had a little bit of money that she put a down payment on a house and said, mm. I'm going to... Uh, um, but someday I'll have a family upstairs and I'll have my dance studio downstairs. Oh. And it turned out that uh, she, instead of a dance studio, she became a Pilates teacher. And so uh, for a few years, we lived upstairs, had our two kids upstairs, and then, it's a long story, but we ended up moving over to the Presidio, which is oh, yeah. the, over by the Golden Gate Bridge, and right. lived in military housing over there so that we could walk the kids to school mm -hmm. for 16 years. And now just this year, we moved back to our little uh, place in, in the city. So now she just commutes downstairs to go to work. And my studio is over on Market Street, so it's about a 30 minute walk. Yeah, so no no driving or parking issues. Well, there is a parking issue because we have two cars. Uh, um, her mother gave us a car when she couldn't drive anymore, so mm -hmm. we only had one. But now we have two cars, and uh, since we drive so little, it's you can't remember where you parked. It's like, and you have to, you know, uh, there, so Monday you can't park on this side of the street from eight to right, ten, right. and so I Tuesday you can't park on that side, and so on, and so where'd you park? I don't know. Who well, who drove it last? I can give you a suggestion for that. Okay. I read in Reader's Digest that this uh, gentleman had a hard time finding his car when he would go into the store yeah. to come out, and so he took in his car a toilet plunger. And every time he got out, he stuck it to the top of his car. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty great. I so like he that. could see it way over there. I so like there that. you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, you know, someone borrowed it, you know. Yeah. They, you just make sure they brought it back. <laughs> right, right, right. I like that. So now, how many days a year are you teaching? Are you on the road? And you're, I know you're here in Sisters, which we love, but. And I leave here after this whole week and fly directly to New York uh, State to teach at Quilting by the Lake. Uh, so it's, I'm gone two weeks this month, oh. and I'm gone uh, 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 12 days next month. Uh, September, I'm mostly free. Uh, I just took a job just a couple of days in September. Uh, October, I'm very busy. So this last two years, since my son Dory and my younger son went to college, mm -hmm. uh, I decided, well, yeah, I can take that job. I can take that job. So I can you're take an empty that nester. Job. I'm an empty nester. And uh, I, uh, and I'm my own idiot uh, travel agent, and so and booking agent. So I just say, yeah, yeah, sure. Oh yeah, I can do that. And so now I've been last last year. I've been gone many months more than I've been home, and I do not like it. I don't yeah. like that. I, I need to be back in my studio working. Right, so, because that's how you get refreshed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're you're pouring it out everywhere you go. That's right. But you have to have the time to take it in that's right and and so are you when you give yourself time to play music how often do you I saw your guitar uh -huh. here so do you take it when you're traveling all over I do uh, I always play a song in my lectures as you might recall mm -hmm. and uh, that way I have to have my guitar with me so I have a guitar with me at all times so it's my good friend in the uh, hotel room at night and so mm -hmm. on when I'm in San Francisco I have a little band two other guys a keyboard player and a singer and me and uh, uh, we meet every Wednesday night. So I have one rehearsal a week, and then we play a gig about once a month or once every two months. Mm -hmm. well, so, that's how, yeah, that is so fun. I keep my hand in. Yeah, so what, just to give a little explanation, what, what would you call your type of quilting? Uh, well, for many years I resisted the... Labels? The labels. But, you know, when people ask me what I do nowadays, I tell them I'm an artist. Oh, mm -hmm. what kind of artist? Oh, I make quilts. Uh, then you start with that whole bunch of questions. But that's right. how I think of myself. I'm just an artist, and I, and, and I make quilts. Mm -hmm. Although, uh, um, it's, it can be confusing to people that know anything about art quilts because 
generally, as soon as you start making uh, art quilts, as, as soon as you want to be intellectually serious about mm -hmm. what you do, then you stop making quilts. And you start, you start making small things that will go on the wall, like right. art. Right. And for me, I make six-foot square quilts. I'm making a blanket, actually. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to make a blanket that would look at home on the walls of any museum. And I'm trying to make a blanket that will uh, equal in artistic value the 19th century masterpieces that I revere. So, like Mary Sawyer. Uh, uh, Schaefer. Schaefer. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to make something that's good. Uh -huh. so, the Smithsonian, you want one of your quilts to someday be taken care of by some curator in the Smithsonian. In the Smithsonian, sure. But in the meantime, I sell quilts to museums. I have them in uh, five major museums right oh. now. Uh, the de Young Museum, the Newark Museum, the Shelburne Museum, uh, um, the, the uh, uh, Museum in Lincoln. So, um, uh, I want to go to the one in Lincoln. Oh, yeah, you got to uh, go that's there. That's the... Uh, the International Quilt Study, Study Center and Museum. Center. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. Yes, I've been, that's on my bucket list yeah. to travel. Yeah, they had, We they, were really close at one point uh, to Nebraska. We well, were in Nebraska. <laughs> it's really great. It's, it's, yeah. it's, there's no place like it. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, yeah, my quilts are in museums already. I get shows in art galleries and they're collected by uh, art collectors. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm doing right now what I've always wanted to do. Yeah. And not many people can say that. No, I don't. Well, I don't know. I, but I know all I know I is that I'm really people. lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I know I was on the cruise in January, and you were on the cruise also with your group of students. I was with Sue Spargo that time, but everyone looked like they were having a grand time. Yeah, they were. It it was like um, freedom. Yeah. You know, there was no, there was no, you have to, do you even pay attention to a quarter inch seam? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the class I taught today requires quarter inch seams. Oh, So, okay. uh, yeah, you know, when I learned how to make quilts from Mary Schaefer and Gwen, uh, you, uh, you had to learn technique like, like bingo, like you really had to know everything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I want my quilts to be technically, you know, at the superior level. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I... Most of the kind of stuff that I do doesn't require quarter-inch seams, right? Mm -hmm. um, it requires freedom. Of well, it does, and what I'm trying to, I mean, at this point in my life, this is what this is why I'm making quilts. Is uh, it's it's a way to be free. I'm trying to uh, make. Uh, I, I, I use when I'm making quilts, I'm free in the universe to express myself to do anything that I want. The, the, that's where I find the most freedom. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm trying to express in my work. That's what I'm trying to foster in my students mm -hmm. is freedom. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that You're welcome. thought. That's a good thought to end on because um, it, it just makes you feel like there's lots of possibilities for us out there to be free. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Baby, if you leave me Say you won't be back That would be the end of me Cause I would have a heart attack You better get some insurance on me, baby I'd take out some insurance on me, baby If we ever, ever said goodbye I'm gonna haul right off and die Darling, I will love you As long as I got breath But if we part, don't you know, sweetheart It's gonna worry me to death You better get some insurance on me, baby Insurance on me, baby If we ever, ever said goodbye 
I'm gonna hold right off and die. You know I don't get sick or in no accidents. I'm as healthy as can be. If you, I had some sense, take my advice and get full life on me. And darling, you don't know me. Like I know myself You couldn't live If you should give all your Love to someone else You better get some insurance On me baby Insurance on me baby If we ever ever said goodbye I'm gonna hold right off and die sick or in no accidents. I'm as healthy as can be. You had some sense, you'd take my advice and get full life on me. Darling, you don't know me like I know myself. I couldn't live if you should give all your I love to someone else, you better get some insurance on me, baby. Insurance on me, baby. If we ever, ever said goodbye, I'm gonna hold right off and die. If we ever, ever said goodbye,